let's get started on trauma. And as always, I like to skip these. You can go back and read those if you want. All right, uh, you know what they say about statistics, you can make them say anything you want. Um, cardiac arrest is the number one cause of death because everybody dies when their heart stops. So you can make, uh, you make statistics, anything you want them to say. However, it is important to note that in people in the younger population, why is trauma the cause of death? Because they haven't lived long enough to have developed enough other lethal medical conditions. Um, the chances of them having developed things like um, heart uh, CAD, um, peripheral vascular disease and such that'll put them at risk of strokes, heart attacks, PEs, um, heart failure, these are much less likely in the younger population. But it is also important to know that, or remember that like young kids, um, pediatrics, they're, they don't know like young pediatrics, they don't know what the cause and effect of something is going to be. They don't realize that touching the stove could cause a burn or, you know, climbing a tree and stepping on a thin branch is going to make them fall. Um, older kids, uh, you know, teens, adolescents, young adults, early 20s, that category find themselves to be invincible or believe themselves to be invincible and then find out they're not um, after they are severely injured or maimed and are um, killed in a wreck. So, um, anytime, so here's your definition. What is trauma? And I think that kind of explains itself. But it's important to realize that it's when the energy can't be absorbed by the body. Um, so, if, if the energy is absorbed, it will cause, uh, well, any energy left over that wasn't absorbed is what's going to cause the drum trauma, which is why a, for example, a bullet that is a hollow point mushroom ring will cause more damage than a bullet that w is a um, full metal jacket and penetrates right through because the there's less energy being absorbed by the tissue and so therefore less trauma. There tends to be. Now, I understand that there's a whole lot of factors, which we will discuss later on, but and, and so that's a very simplistic perspective on that. As we can see here, we have a spleen. This spleen has um, suffered a penetrating trauma. And here we can see the results of that penetrating trauma res uh, causing it to burst. The pressure wave that entered that spleen, which is considered a solid organ, caused the entire thing to rupture. And instead of waiting for that organ to heal, the doctors opted to remove that organ um, and be able to clot off or uh, stop blood flow there and treat the blood loss. This can happen both from penetrating trauma and blunt force trauma. Growing up, I had a friend who was kicked in the gut by a young horse, a very young horse, and caused a splenic laceration. So it can happen in a number of different uh, ways. So these are the various forms of energy that we, our body can absorb. Um, we normally think of mechanical energy and some occasionally I think uh, barometric energy will come into play uh, when you think like blast injuries and such like that. But remember thermal energy is what causes burns. However, chemical and electrical energy injury also cause burns. So um, we'll, we'll see how these various things affect. Um, I think these are just terms that you should be familiar with. Um, honestly, we don't really get into these much more than that. Oops, went the wrong way, sorry. All right, so if a 10, well, we've probably all seen a um, person at the gym lay down on the floor and place a 45 pound plate on their chest to do a uh, sit up or something like that to to do an exercise and 45 pound plate is heavy but it's not excessively heavy and it's not something that's going to cause injury to the body now what would happen if that uh athletes or you know that person at, at the gym partner decided to stand over them and instead of setting the 45 pound weight onto the person's chest, person A's, the one on the floor, decided to drop 
that 45 pound weight onto their chest. What has changed? One, the patient, the, the, the person places the weight on the other person's chest and the other is they drop it from a standing position onto the person's chest. What changed between those two scenarios? Uh, yes, yes, gravity is a bitch, and um, the force did change, yes, um, but what caused the force to change? And I think I heard somebody say it. It's velocity. So in both scenarios, the 45-pound plate is the same weight and covers the same square inches, the same area and so you're dissipating 45 pounds over a fairly large area on the chest you know the full size of the plate but what changed in the two scenarios was the velocity and a deceleration of the object yes it was traveling at a high speed and then came to a sudden stop as it hit the rib cage and therefore trauma will be induced if you were to take 45 pounds and form it into a single pointed rod, like an upside down cone, essentially, and set that in the middle of the chest, what would happen to the chest? It would likely be, do what? Cave in. Yeah, it would cave in. It would likely the cone the, the pointed cone would pierce the chest and if it was dropped from any from any elevation it would more it would most definitely pierce likely all the way through the chest because the difference here is not the speed in this case but it is the area in which the force is applied so a lot of force applied over or a lot of mass applied over a large area is not going to cause the issues that a small amount of mass applied in a or a large or a similar amount of mass applied in a very small area but at the same time a large object moving really slow is not going to cause the damage that a small object moving really fast will cause there are extremes of all of those circumstances so i you know not ignoring that i recognize that there are extremes but these are the general principles that we want to look for when we're assessing our patients for trauma a the trauma that a patient falling off of a ladder and landing flat on their back on a flat surface the trauma they experience will be very different than the trauma experienced by an individual that fell off of a ladder and landed in the middle of their back on a fence on a fence rail because now the entire force is being applied in a very different manner in a different location um so we're going to look at various things here and how that how that's going to affect them as we move forward and then of course you know the duration and direction i think that kind of goes without saying is how long was that force applied and to what magnitude was it applied this can be clearly um shown with patients who we pick up at nursing homes how many times do we find them to have large bed sores on their tailbone or something like that and you think sitting you're you're sitting on your butt right now in class you don't have a, a sore on your butt I mean, I hope you don't. And I know there's times where I've felt like I was going to because I had to sit in class so long, but we don't normally experience any kind of trauma from that. However, here we have patients who are lying on their back for extended periods of time, and now all of a sudden they have sores as a result of that. And that's because the pressure was being exerted for an even longer period of time, a much longer period of time. And that's why patients in uh, long-term care like that are supposed to be repositioned every two hours to prevent excessive pressure or continuous pressure on that tissue. So, um, yeah. Blunt trauma, I think, all right, don't wanna keep going the wrong direction with this. Okay, so the type of trauma 
the trauma that we will experience will be dependent on the type of energy that is applied to the body and the location of the body where that energy is applied. Um, you know, a baseball bat striking somebody on the side of the head is going to create a very different type of trauma than if it was to hit them smack in the gut. And the reason is, uh, wh while both can be very injurious and both can be very devastating, the, a hard object like a bat striking the side of the skull can cause skull fractures and then the tissue underneath, the brain tissue, is very susceptible to high energy impacts. Whereas the organs and the tissue in the abdomen, which are predominantly hollow and uh, very very good at absorbing energy and high energy impacts, are not going to show nearly the same type of trauma. It's still r a risk, you know. But I'm just trying to give the difference there. Liquid containing organs, solid organs, the brain, the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, um, even the heart are much more, uh, pancreas is another one, they're much more susceptible to high energy trauma than hollow organs, air-filled organs, like the stomach and the intestines, the bladder, and such, and even the lungs, because they will give and absorb that energy and transfer that energy through their air-filled center core more efficiently. One of the things that we're gonna look at here is mechanisms and how uh, to predict injuries based on the mechanism that we're looking at. For years, mechanism of injury was used as the dictator of whether we transported the patient to the um, trauma center and how we transported the patient to the trauma center. Now we've actually moved mechanism of injury down to the third level of decision making. Um, and it, it's just not as uh, likely or as important as we used to think it was. And that has a lot more to do with the advances in safety features on vehicles and various things that make it easier uh, and an advancement in knowledge on trauma that makes it easier to be able to recognize what is or isn't going to be a positive outcome or concerning outcome for the patient. All right, so velocity, I think you can see what that means. Distance per uh, unit of time, this is miles per hour, feet per second, meters per second, uh, that kind of a thing. Acceleration, this is the rate of change. This is where you get the um, meters per second squared or meters per second per second. You know, they're going to increase a speed of five feet per second for every second, and that's how they accelerate. Acceleration and deceleration are the same formula. It's the same concept as to whether they're speeding up or slowing down. Acceleration and deceleration is the reason that we are able to drive in cars and not die every single time we step on the brakes. The brakes create friction and slow us down in a controlled manner, so the g-forces uh, forces of gravity against our body are not felt. Whereas if we were to suddenly stop like we hit a concrete bridge abutment every time uh, we wanted to stop the car, we would have a much different outcome. So gravity, I think we kind of established that. Kinetic energy, this is a really important detail here and I like to uh, bring that up. We'll show you some videos in a little bit. Um, mass divided by two times velocity squared. And if you understand that those um, basic math concepts, mass is cut in half and velocity is multiplied by itself in this formula. This means the speed at which the object is traveling is far more dangerous than the mass of the object. A car, a small car hit traveling 70 miles an hour and hitting you could cause a lot more damage than a dump truck traveling at 30 miles per hour. Even though the dump truck is so much larger the small car's velocity is going to create a much more concerning uh, situation. And for that, let's swap over to another video real quick so that you can see an example of that. All right, so um, questions on that so far? All right. All right, so this is a big deal, uh, you know, a really big 
uh, factor that was the angle of the impact that the vehicles are hitting or the angle of impact of any trauma whatsoever. If you've ever played um, uh, paintball with your friends, you probably noticed that the paintballs that hit you across the arm or the leg and cause a grazing blow tend to hurt quite a bit more than the ones that hit uh, direct on, and that generally has a lot more to do with the way the trauma was pushed into those various parts of the tissue and, and the type of trauma, the, the abrasion or the burn of it rubbing past versus the just a sudden stop of impact like in your chest. Of course, the difference in size. If a small car hits a large dump truck, the small car is going to suffer the greater damage because it was the less mass. The dump truck can of absorb the mass, the energy more effect effectively, and therefore most of the trauma or most of the damage is going to be deferred to the smaller vehicle. I think this kind of goes without saying. Kinetics, the energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is only transferred from one location to the other. And that's why we have the various safety features inside the car. The crumple, the crumple zones, the seat belts, the airbags, all of these work together to absorb that energy and to decelerate the, patient, the, the patient's body in order to reduce their overall trauma outcome. Not really trying to turn this into a physics lecture. Somebody mentioned this earlier, the second law of motion, mass times acceleration or deceleration equals force. And that is true. It's that concept that I was talking about earlier with the weights. This first law of motion here is uh, plays a major role with students. Um, when they are at rest, they tend to stay that way until acted by an outside source, like a due date for an assignment. All right, um, not, not, don't get too hung up on the G-forces here or the accelerations. That's not going to play a role in your test or stuff like that. All right, so multi-system trauma or de is definitely what we think of when we're going to, when we think trauma, we think multiple injuries, major traumas, um, like from a car crash or a high-level fall or various things like that. But what this means is you have multiple parts of the body that have been injured at the same time. And instead of dealing with an isolated injury like a kid fell off the monkey bars and now they have a broken collarbone, you now have multiple broken bones or damage to other organs as well. The big issue with multi-system trauma is the tendency to get distracted by grotesque injuries that are not actually life-threatening at the moment. And so what we want to focus on here is making certain that you remember what are life-threatening injuries, follow your XABC and exsanguinating hemorrhage, airway breathing circulation, follow that formula and avoid secondary type issues that you don't need to deal with. So. We understand the definition of blunt trauma as it's stated here. But let's refresh on the phases of a car accident or the phases of trauma. When specifically referring to trauma or with car accidents, we have five phases. Most of the other types of trauma are going to have less than this because of, of the circumstance. But the first is the vehicle. Whatever it is that you're in, the object that you're riding in, vehicle, bike, motorcycle, plane, I don't, it doesn't matter what it is, barrel over Niagara Falls. The first phase of trauma is going to be the deceleration of that vehicle. When that, ob whatever you're riding in that vehicle hits an immovable object or another object, maybe movable, and creating a deceleration. The second phase is when you are inside your car or vehicle and you hit the inside of the vehicle. So you're lurching forward, hitting the um, seat belt or hitting the steering wheel or the, the roof or something like that in your car, depending on the nature of the accident. The third is the deceleration of your inner internal organs. The outside of your body hits the steering wheel or the ceiling or the windshield, whatever it is, but then in the inside of your body, the organs have to continue to decelerate. It's kind of like driving with that cup of coffee in this open cup of coffee on the dashboard or in the center console. You don't want to spill the coffee. I mean, how many of you had that FTO that that was how they taught you to drive the ambulance? They put the cup of coffee on the dashboard and said, don't spill it on the way back to the station. 
a very common way of driving, and it's a great way uh, to get both the idea of trauma here, but also how to drive safely. Is you want to decelerate in an, and accelerate in a smooth manner that allows you to allows everything in your body, everything in that cup, to accelerate at the same period of time, in the same time, instead of the cup stopping faster than the coffee and the coffee slur sloshing all over the front of your dashboard. So, phase four of trauma is your secondary collisions. This tends to be anything that's inside the vehicle that moved around and hit you. So, your textbook on the back seat of the car flying forward and hitting you in the back of the head. That would be a secondary collision. The fifth phase, this is when there's other impacts on the vehicle. So, your vehicle may have veered off the road, hit a, a um, large mailbox. That was the primary or the first impact. You know, we would call that phase one, but then it hits another tree later. That would be phase five or your wreck on the interstate. And then another vehicle comes along and hits you after you've already stopped. That's another impact. So that's another phase five impact. And it can actually start the whole because you're at, at rest and then you're accelerating. It can start the whole uh, phases again. Your body then hits the inside of the vehicle and your organs hit the inside of your body and so on. So, let's talk about impact patterns. Frontal impacts, I think that description speaks for itself. These tend to create a lot of trauma because in frontal impacts, especially when it's two vehicle frontal impacts, there's a lot of energy combined. And you have to consider the combined energy of both vehicles, both the... Um, so if both vehicles are traveling at 70 miles per hour, your combined speed of impact is 140 miles per hour. If both vehicles are only traveling 35 miles per hour, you think 35 miles per hour, it's not really that fast, I don't need to worry, probably don't need to wear a seatbelt, but you drift across that center line, hit another car doing 35 miles per hour, and now your combined speed is 70, which is the same as you hitting a tree at 70 miles an hour. So. Our vehicles are definitely designed to absorb frontal impacts. A lot of energy and a lot of effort has been put into making vehicles safe from frontal impacts, but that doesn't mean we are uh, going to be completely protected. Frontal impacts are still a very dangerous and common type of impact for severe injuries. So you can see some really severe injuries here. And... That brings me to the next video that I wanted to show you guys, talking about frontal impacts and getting perspectives on this. We've probably heard it said a dozen times, oh, cars aren't the way they, aren't built the way they used to be anymore. People don't, you know, you get a little fender bender and your whole car's destroyed. Well, why is that? Well, let's look at it. Here's a 1959 Bel Air and a 2009 Chevy Malibu. That's the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety's front crash of a 2009 Chevrolet Malibu in 1959 Chevrolet Bel Air. In slow motion, you can see the differences in how the new and classic cars perform in this version of the traditional frontal offset test. The Institute conducted this test to commemorate its 50th anniversary. It dramatically shows how much improvement has been made in passenger protection since the nonprofit organization opened its doors. The two cars collide in an explosion of metal, glass, and plastics. Where the Malibu crumple zone absorbs much of the crash force is ahead of the windshield, the Bel Air structure allows the lighter car to compress the passenger compartment. The impact is made worse for the Bel Air driver by the lack of airbags, head restraint, and even a seat belt. As a result, injuries to the neck, chest, and both legs would be likely. Consequently, the Bel Air receives a poor rating across the board. On the other hand, the modern Malibu provides good protection, with the dummy movement being well controlled. Measures indicate a low risk to most body regions, though a foot injury would be possible. Beyond the safety gear, advancements in vehicle engineering give the Malibu a clear advantage in this matchup. While classic cars are often considered to be rock solid, this 59 demonstrates how much better today's cars are, and the IHS has played a key role in driving these advancements. The past 50 years, the Institute has made a real impact. The roads today are safer for it. For complete.
So I think I think this image right here really says the whole thing when it comes to these crumple zones. Point out, I want to point out, both of these vehicles were traveling at 35 miles an hour when they set up this collision. So two offset frontal impacts and the driver of the Bel Air crushed his spine into the roof. That was probably an unsurvivable impact for the Bel Air driver. And he was traveling at 35 miles per hour. Well, the driver of the Malibu, if you'll notice, went down and into the steering wheel, face into the airbag, and did not experience any type of movement upward. Yes, he may have suffered a foot injury, uh, but a foot or ankle injury is a whole lot different than a neck and back and um, brain injury. This is a example here. This is a depiction of what crumple zones and the transmission of energy and trauma creates or, or affords for us. So frontal impacts, an example there. Depending on the way that you ride in the vehicle has a lot to determine whether you're going to go down and under or over, uh, up and over. You know, is your head going to hit the steering wheel or are you going to go under the seat? And this is, has a lot to do, or not under the seat, under the dash. It has a lot to do with how you sit in the car while you're driving. Generally, if you're wearing a seat belt, neither of these injuries should take place. Although they can still happen if you tend to drive too close to the steering wheel or too far away from the steering wheel. For example, if you ride, if you drive leaning back further, that increases your likelihood of sliding under the seat belt and sliding forward and then hitting, um, causing a leg injury. Which frankly would be a lot better than the people who drive like this, who are gonna go forward and hit this, uh, the windshield. All right, side impacts. Um, these are one of the impacts that we have the least protection against when we're talking about just standard impact uh, crashes. If the vehicle is impacted on the side opposite the passenger, the occupant tends to have a lot of crumple zone because you have the room in between, you know, the empty seat. But if it happens on the side the occupant is on, it tends to not have a lot of room before uh, the, tra the transfer of energy is directly onto the body of the victim, of the occupant. So, and this is one reason T-bone impacts tend to be very damaging and dangerous for people. And frontal and rear impacts, they have the greatest level of protection. Side impacts have the least protection for them and therefore have some of the more significant traumas. Uh, one of the biggest traumas I think that we need to remember besides things like fractured pelvises and such like that and whiplash on the neck from being slid sideways, you know, if the impact came this way and pushed you in, over, hit your head on the windshield. Um, another major exam, uh, example is the aortic dissections. I know that was mentioned on the frontal impacts, but it's also a big concern here for lateral impacts because if your heart is hanging in the center of your chest like this your aorta wraps up and down if you get impacted on the side of the vehicle your body slides but your heart doesn't or you get impacted this way and your um your whole body moves but the heart swings it can tear the aorta open because of the swinging of the aorta and so that's a type of injury that we would need to anticipate now that tearing could be a very small tear that would cause them to bleed out slowly or it could be a very significant tear, and they're going to be dead before we get there. Rear end collisions, probably the easiest one to survive. As it says here, they have the most survivors. Generally, there's a trunk, a rear hatch, a large amount of vehicle behind you. And when you get rear ended, your vehicle may have been moving forward already. So there's a decrease in deceleration. When rear ended, your um, the speed tends to be only the vehicle that was moving speed and then your vehicle can spring forward kind of like a pool ball you hit it hit a ball with the cue and then the cue ball stops and the other ball continues going so there's an absorption and transfer of energy so it's not exerting near the energy and force onto the uh, occupants of the car that was a hit as it would have otherwise <clears throat> 
as with a frontal impact. Now, the um, driver of the vehicle that caused the wreck, they tend to be receiving in, um, energy as if it was a frontal impact, but again, it's not going to be as intense for them as it would have been if they were frontal impact with another car coming the opposite direction. Whiplash used to be a very common injury in rear end collisions, and it's actually not that common anymore. People uh, are very concerned about it. They're very commonly complaining of whiplash and things like that. But really, as far as a true whiplash injury, it's very rare to see it because of the way headrests are designed. Vehicles are now built with headrests. As we saw in the 59 Bel Air, it had no headrests whatsoever. The seat barely came up to the shoulders of the um, crash mannequin. Vehicles now have seats that go all the way up to the top of our heads and the headrest leans forward. It's adjustable. It should be adjusted so that while you're driving comfortably, it's right behind your head so that when you have that impact, it's hitting your head. Now, if the person has their seat leaned way back and they don't have the headrest adjusted properly or it's too low, then there's definite cause for injury or concern with that, but generally, whiplash can be very easily avoided in these types of collisions because of modern safety features. Now, rotational or quarter panel impacts, this is when you've got hit on the corner of the car, generally sends the car spinning, and that's what is one of the more concerning aspects of it. it the car was not absorbing the T-bone collision, it was hit like on the front corner or the back corner, and is now rotating. This rotation or spin can throw the body around, It it can cause ejection, not near as likely as it is with a rollover, but it can cause some um, ejections. But the big concern is the unpredictability of where the trauma is going to happen in the car, where the impacts are going to be, because what else is it going to hit? So, and then there's rollovers. Rollovers are the most likely to cause ejection. If you are not seat belted in, you are almost guaranteed to be ejected during a rollover or at least partially ejected. Frankly, partial ejections are more concerning than a uh, full ejection simply because after the body was partially ejected from the vehicle and continues to roll, now you have that wrapping of the body around the vehicle or the crushing of the body by the vehicle as it rolls over it um, versus somebody who's just thrown clear of the vehicle and then lands on the ground. So rollovers can be um, pretty uh, traumatic for a patient, can be very injurious even at low speeds. I uh, worked one not long ago where some kids, late teens, early 20s, decided to do donuts in a dirt parking lot, parking area at a ball field, and you know caught a rut the wrong way and sent their uh, Jeep Cherokee rolling over, or Grand Cherokee, whatever it was, rolling multiple times low speed but rolled multiple times and there were several injuries because people weren't seat belted in. So um, yeah, I mean, I really don't want to have to make this a class about how to wear seat belts because I feel like that should be clear to us by this time. But. Even uh, another reason to wear a seatbelt is the airbag. Airbags are specifically designed to stop the, excel, uh, the, the face from hitting the steering wheel. But if we're not wearing a seatbelt, then our entire body is going to hit the airbag. Or if we're sitting too close to the steering wheel, we don't know how far out that airbag is going to deploy, that airbag might hit our body while it's still inflating. And if we're too close and it hits while it's still inflating, it will cause more damage to us. Um, if we're too far away from the seat, if we're leaning too far back in the car, it can fully inflate and then start to deflate before the body hits it and then it doesn't create or provide the uh, protection that it needs to. You've probably heard, don't let kids under the age of 12 sit in the front passenger seat. This is because if the airbag deploys, it has a 20 inch, 15 to 20 inch, depending on the vehicle, but a 15 to 20 inch deployment zone. And the child being under 12 tends to be short enough that if they're 
If they start to do the lean forward on the seat belt, that airbag deploys and hits them on the top of the head, it can fracture their neck because it's still deploying as they move their head forward instead of it deploying because it deploys up, not first and not out. So they move forward and then it hits them in the head. Whereas if you were an adult, it's deploying up to your face as you decelerate into it. So you can see this is an abrasion and contusion, both abrasion and contusion from an airbag deployment uh, impacting the chest. This individual was probably sitting too close to the airbag. All right, so motorcycle crashes definitely come with their fair uh, share of injuries, things that we need to be concerned about and watch out for. However, just because there is a motorcycle and there was a wreck doesn't mean it's the same thing. Uh, they're all the same. A lot of motorcycle riders who take classes and you know proper education on how to ride are taught to separate themselves from the motorcycle when they see a crash is imminent. And it's important for us to determine when did you separate from the bike? Now, separating from the bike in a controlled manner is not without injury or risk, but it doesn't tend to be the type of the same type of injuries as if they separated from the bike during or after the impact. So when a motorcycle rider sees that they are about to crash into another vehicle or object or whatever, and they lay the bike down on its side and they push away from it, the bike continues and they slow down. The bike may have a pretty dramatic impact, but they go sliding in another direction because they separated from it versus when the bike t-bones another car or hits an abrupt a bridge abutment or something like that and then goes flying off into another object or something that's going to cause a much more significant injury and we need to determine at what stage in that wreck did they separate from the vehicle and did they separate intentionally or were they truly thrown from the motorcycle of course, when a person is riding and a car hits them versus the bike hitting the car, right? So the car hits the bike. Generally, those riders don't have any warning or expectation, and those injuries tend to be quite significant. Um, yes, they wear some protective gear, and some protective gear can be helpful. Helmet, le leathers, and all that, especially for road rash and uh, striking the ground, but very little of that is going to help their neck and back. Some of the newer, um, well, there's some new technology out there where they're making airbags that inflate around the neck of the m bike rider so that if they come off the bike, it gives them some support and rigidity of their neck, decreasing the likelihood of a spinal cord or a cervical spine injury. And some of the bike um, jackets and things like that are armored in the back to protect them as well. But still, this is very limited and is generally intended to protect them from separating and sliding and then hitting an object versus riding the a bike into an object and being thrown or uh, being hit by another car. There's just not a lot of protection that can happen there. So what, what was damaged on the bike? What, how much damage, how severe was the damage, was there skid marks? How long did they try to stop and how much deceleration happened before the impact? What happened to the other vehicle? How much deformity and things like that? Helmets should always be replaced after any form of impact. Bike helmets, motorcycle helmets, uh, horseback riding helmets, they should never be used more than once. The same thing goes with car, act, um, car seats in cars. I know that a lot of people think that that's ridiculous and just a gimmick um, to get to sell more um, car seats, but car seats are stored in vehicles. And if you live here in the South, which we all do, we know that cars get insanely hot during the summer. Now, this is why we can't leave our kids in the car when we go into the store, or our pet in the car or whatever. We have to, cannot do that because it gets so crazy hot in those vehicles. Well, that's baking the plastic, making the plastic brittle. Any plastic that's exposed to heat will become brittle. And then we um, put that car seat through a significant impact and it's being pulled against its restraints, the belts, the straps and such like that it can cause small fractures in that plastic that has been made brittle. Now those fractures may not be visible, but they still are, are there and weaken it, making it more likely to fail in the next impact if it was to be impacted again. And so the concern is that 
if the car seat has been in an impact once, it won't it won't be certified or this the company won't guarantee that it'll be safe for the second impact and generally any ness or any efforts to pr determine whether it's safe to continue to use costs more than just buying a new car seat um for those of you that are curious about getting a new car seat uh or worried about that because yes they're expensive and i've had to buy way more than i wished i had to um places like target will routinely do um public service uh, drives where they will give you a voucher, a, a very significant discount for even free. Um, I think the one I got the other day or a couple months ago was like 50% off. Um, I turned in my old car seat and was able to get a very steep discount on buying a new car seat. Um, fortunately, the one I was turning in had been in a wreck and that's why we were needing to replace it. So it kind of worked out nice. But look for those kinds of areas. Also recommend that to your patients. Remind them if their car seat was involved in a car wreck, their insurance should replace that car seat. Um, and that's kind of a public service thing that we can remind patient advocacy. Hey, you were in a car wreck, please get your car seat repl replaced. Make certain that you report that to your insurance. The insurance will buy you the new car seat. And I, you know, I can vouch for that. They did. They replaced the car seat. So, um, head-on impacts for motorcycles. Of course, the rider comes over the handlebars and continues forward. Uh, angular impacts is where the motorcycle strikes another object and um, generally on the side, their legs or arms are going to be significantly injured. Um, ejection, they're gonna continue off of, or fly off the bike. With ejection, especially from when they had a frontal impact and then are ejected, look for bilateral femur fractures. That is a very common injury pattern because as they come over the handlebars, their legs catch the handlebars and it snaps their femurs. So look out for that um, with those forward ejections. And then, like I said before, laying the bike down. This is where the rider intentionally lays the bike onto the ground and separates from it before the impact happens. All right, this is the only time we remove a helmet. If you cannot maintain the airway because of the helmet or the helmet is not fitting snugly on the head, we can pad under their shoulders and back and such in order to compensate for the size of the helmet. But if the helmet is not fitting tight, it's not going to control their C-spine. So we would have to remove it. Um, I think it should be pointed out that if they're wearing like a half cap or a skull cap or one of those really short helmets that only comes down to here, that's easy to remove. That's not causing any trauma. Go ahead and remove it. That's not the problem. What they're worried about is when the helmet extends below the nape of the neck down here or the nape of the head, and is one of those lower helmets or a full face. That's when you wanna make the decision as to whether or not we remove it. When it's just a helmet that just comes to the top of the ears, easily removed, there's no concern in it of trauma to the neck or manipulation of the neck by removing it. All right, so um, this kind of moves out of vehicles and starts getting into other types of injuries and all that. So why don't we go ahead and take a quick break? We've been here about an hour. Let's stretch our legs. All right, so pedestrian injuries. Um, there is actually some debate the debate over how this all works and the triad, triad that's associated with impacts um, for adults this seems to be pretty consistent it's with pediatrics that the question seems to rise as to how pedestrian accidents happen and do they happen in the anticipated patterns so generally when an adult is hit by a car okay cars do constitute the most common vehicle on the road so when an adult is hit by a car the auto is going to strike the body uh, uh, or the impact of the person with its bumper, you know, generally the lower legs or something like this. This results on the person, the pedestrian, being thrown up onto the deck, onto the grill, onto the hood of the vehicle, and then the third impact being when they're th 
fall off the vehicle onto the ground. Now, if you think this person was struck by a um, truck or a larger vehicle, the bumper would hit their legs, their body would hit the grill because it's you know set back from the bumper, and then they hit the ground. So whether this is an up and over, which tends to be the case for adults because their center of gravity is higher, you hit them, they'll hit the dash and wind or the hood and windshield and then fall off the car or if it's a uh, younger person smaller person they'll or a larger vehicle they get hit and then thrown forward by the impact this is waddell's triad where they're claiming you know bumper hits pelvis and femur chest and abdomen then hit the grill and then head strikes ground waddell's triad is one that certain re some research is suggesting actually doesn't happen that commonly so while we think of this is the expected injury patterns they're actually not that common um regardless i think um, as we can see here, the types of injuries the patient is going to sustain has a lot to do with the size of the person getting hit and how they were hit. Um, honestly, the incidence of a person standing in the middle of the road when a car traveling at significant speed hits them is rather rare. It happens, but it's rather rare. And a lot of times what we see is people backed over by cars or clipped by a mirror coming out of a parking lot or something like that. And then, you know, we're dealing with a completely different set of injuries. Um, so look at the impact, look at the, um, the, the way their body was hit by the vehicle and then anticipate what injuries may have resulted from that, both from the primary impact and then the secondary and tertiary when they finally hit the ground all right falls from heights these can result in any number of types of injuries and just because the patient jumped off of or fell from a pretty good height doesn't mean that they're guaranteed significant injury but we need to look at how they landed also just because they landed on their feet doesn't mean they're going to be okay uh, a lot of people are rather unathletic like myself it took me a really long time to figure out how to jump onto the ground without hurting my legs because oh you're supposed to bend your legs and land on your toes well when you land on your heels flat on your heels you can break your calcaneus that's also you know the heel bone the ankle bone this will transfer the energy up the leg and into the lower back because from that angle the leg actually has a pretty good support in the pelvis so you don't have a lot of issues with the proximal femur or the uh, dislocating the hip or something like that with the elderly that becomes a much bigger issue but with younger people not so big but then it transfers the weight and the impact to the lower lumbar region of the spine and that's where you can get a compression injury in that lower lumbar so you'll look for fractured ankles and then lower lumbar compression injuries this is called lover's leap syndrome or don juan syndrome the idea of don juan was a a Casanova character who particularly or who preferred married women and when their husbands would show up unexpectedly he'd jump out the second floor window and end up breaking his ankles or you know injuring his lower back in the fall that's the where the term Don Juan syndrome came from so look at what they were landing on look at what um what their physical condition obviously if a gymnast falls uh, jumps out of a window i'm not really worried about them being injured but if a gymnast falls off of a ladder or falls off of a you know bar or something like that that's a much bigger concern because it wasn't a controlled fall how did they fall or jump and how high was it so now we get into penetrating trauma. Normally, this is uh, there's actually a wide variety of injuries that can cause penetrating trauma. Uh, we normally think of knives and bullets being the uh, most common, and they are fairly common. But there's a number of other things that cause penetrating trauma as well. This would also include any form of laceration or things like that. So um, low velocity, sharp edge objects, um, knives but arrows sometimes get into the low uh, velocity high velocity are going to be uh, bullets medium velocity is going to be certain types of arrows and crossbow bolts um, now it could be shrapnel from an explosion of some sort um, you know accidental explosion not talking not getting dramatic like an IED um, but 
a lot of times, depending on your distance from the explosion, that those projectiles can actually be high velocity and very high velocity. Um, but uh, uh, bullets tend to are always in the meat high velocity range unless they are a really long way away and they've slowed down a lot. So this is an example of penetrating trauma. I'm going to guess, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm pretty certain this is a gunshot wound to the thumb, considering it's talking about firearm injuries. Um, this tends to happen when people don't know how to clean their gun properly or unload it before cleaning and they end up shooting themselves in the hand while they're trying to take it apart or something like that. Um, other things obviously could cause this, but that's kind of the more common. When somebody's shot in the hand or shot in the foot, that tends to be the origin of the problem as they were cleaning the gun and accidental discharge. I met a guy one time who not only was he dumb enough to do this, he was also dumb enough to talk about it, but he decided to demonstrate to his wife the complete safety of the Colt Arm Army 1911. Um, so if you're familiar, 45 caliber automatic pistol, semi-automatic pistol, um, it has a feature that if there's pressure on the end of the barrel, so if you're holding the gun in your hand, you put pressure on the end of the barrel, it actually won't fire. The, the trigger cannot be pulled. It's a safety feature uh, intended so that if you're reholstering it and not paying attention or careful you don't, um, and there's pressure on the tip of the barrel, you're not gonna accidentally pull the trigger and shoot yourself in the leg. So kind of a decent safety feature. So he puts his hand, he's like, look, this is a super safe gun to carry. I can't shoot myself. See, I got my hand on the end of the barrel and I'm pulling the trigger, nothing happens. Okay, makes sense. I mean, it's a thing, it's a feature, cool. He's doing this in his living room in front of his wife and then takes his hand off the end of the barrel without taking his finger off the trigger. And as soon as his hand comes off the barrel, his finger pulls the trigger and a gun goes off and he shoots himself right through the palm of his hand. So like I said, not only is he dumb enough to do this, he was dumb enough to then talk about it later. Um, but, you know, lot, lots of those kinds of injuries happen on a regular basis quite frequently. Generally, we don't see those. Um, we don't end up running those calls. They tend to take care of themselves uh, somewhat out of embarrassment. But, uh, yeah, uh, stab wounds. Where did the stab wound happen? Where where was the knife? Um, how long of a knife? So how much penetration did the knife get? Um, what was the angle? An interesting example of this that really caught me by surprise one night. Um, re responded to a residence for a male stabbed. Police on scene cleared it, said there was heavy bleeding. We get there and the guy is sitting in a chair in the middle of his lawn, only wearing pants, no shirt or anything like that, laid back in the chair like this, looking like he's dead, covered in blood. I mean, completely covered in blood from the neck down. We're thinking, what on earth happened to this guy? Turns out he had a single stab wound right here on his chest. Um, just just below the heart, or right, or just at the bottom of the heart on the left side. And we're like, oh, that's not good. Tons of blood everywhere. He's barely responding to us. Takes a lot of painful stimuli to wake him up. Uh, he was um, looked like he was in really rough shape. We we drive him. We st we get him loaded up. We start heading to the hospital. Um, putting occlusive dressings on the wound, trying to hold pressure. It's not really bleeding very much externally anymore. Um, but we're like. Getting on the, we get on the interstate, we're headed to the trauma center, and I start noticing, I'm like, I, I even said it, I was like, if this guy's stabbed in the lung or in the heart, he's sure handling it really, really well because his heart rate was doing just fine. It really wasn't tachycardic. His blood pressure was perfectly fine. Uh, his O2 sat was still great. We're like, what? How in the world is this guy not dead? Like, he should be dying by now. We get him to Grady and uh, what, you know, our local trauma center, for those of you that are, aren't from Georgia, uh, we'll get there and they shoot the x-ray and it turns out the knife had entered his chest this way and gone straight up. And so the entire blade had buried in his, um, and it was only about that long of a blade they determined from the depth of the cut. But the entire blade was in his pec muscle and had never punctured through the rib cage. And so it had never gotten into the lung or the heart. 
Everything was just muscle bleeding and superficial wounds. The altered mental status and all that was from the incredible amount of alcohol he had ingested before the stabbing, which is also why he had bled so heavily. And he was actually lived, you know, he lived, he was fine. He had very limited injury because of the angle of the insertion. The knife had been stabbed at him up in this manner and had not penetrated his uh, rib cage. So no major organs were injured. So it's kind of an interesting example of how where that wound takes place is plays a big role on the type of wound or the type of injuries and treatment that they're going to need. So let's talk about firearms and gunshot wounds and what we need to know. And obviously there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of variety amongst gunshot wounds and there's a few pieces of information that is very important for us to know. Um, the type of firearm. Now what we're talking here is, is it a rifle? Is it a shotgun or is it a pistol? That's what we need to know. We, we're not worried about anything other, you know, models or anything like that. The velocity of the projectile is going to be heavily impact um, dependent on the type of firearm. You know, rifles are going to have a much higher velocity than a pistol, uh, which is going to have a much higher velocity than a shotgun. Shotguns tend to have a lower velocity. I realize, and for those of you that are firearm enthusiasts and go hunting and all that, there's a lot of exceptions to all of these rules. So I'm saying that in a very general sense, the average rifle has a higher velocity than the average handgun, which has a higher velocity than the average shotgun. So if we're comparing a, you know, a two um a 308 rifle with a 45 caliber pistol with a 12 gauge number seven birdshot like there's a you know you gotta look at what your averages are here and then the design of the projectile i mentioned earlier about a hollow point round versus a full metal jacket round and then you also want to consider was this a single projectile or is this a shotgun load and so and how that changes things so i am going to show you for those of you that aren't as uh familiar show you some picture of these different rounds so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, all right, so here we can see in this picture, we have two rounds. These are the same caliber round. We have the full metal jacket here. You can see how it is a round complete tip where we have the hollow point over here. This is a hole in the middle. This is why it's called a. This is what hollow points do, and when they impact uh, tissue, this is why they're used for hunting and things like that. When they impact tissue and bone, they mushroom out. They spread out, going from a projectile this size to a projectile that size. And so you can imagine that causes a lot more trauma when you're using it for hunting, but also a lot more trauma when it's used against a uh, or when it hits human tissue as well. Um, this is an example here where a hollow point round got lodged into ballistics gelatin. So you can see because of that increase in size, it didn't transfer, it didn't, it, all of its energy was absorbed by the tissue and therefore greater trauma would have been um, caused. So, um, so that's some basic concepts there. Let's look at some... Not piston. <sighs> All right, so here we can see um, this is a great picture. Let me. Um... All right, so this is a really good picture showing the various size rounds that we will see and a lot of different um, uh, firearms. So down here we have 32, 380. Uh, nine millimeter, various sizes of nine millimeter. Um, you see some 45 ACP, uh, I think number six, yeah, 45 ACP, 38 special, getting a little bigger. These are all pistol rounds down here. Uh, number 10 is, um, can be, or is actually a carbine round. Um, 
but can be used in a pistol round as well. So you can see some very sized pistol rounds, and then we get up into the 762 by 39. That's what a AK-47 would use. 556. That's what a uh, of modern sporting rifles use and then this is the 762 by 54 that's a common 308 round or actually that's not 308 that's a uh, Mosin but it's similar very similar in function to the 308 for those of you that are enthusiasts please don't get mad at me it's just for demonstration purposes and then this is a 12 gauge double lot buck notice how you have these pistol rounds, the powder is down here in the brass, this is the projectile, then you have these rifle rounds, a lot more room for powder, but yet somewhat smaller or similar size project, or sm somewhat larger but similar size projectiles. Then you have the shotgun round, and here in the shotgun round you have a number of projectiles that are of diameter similar to these pistol rounds, but there's a whole bunch of them packed in there together. This means that they're not going to move with as much velocity, but there'll be a lot more impact on them. There, uh, a lot more projectiles can um, impact the patient's tissue. Let's see, some other examples. Um, Uh, let's see, so here is a good example of that. This kind of gives us the um, standard breakdown of various shotgun rounds. Birdshot, very, very small pellets, low brass, not a lot of the gunpowder is down here where the brass is, it's called, um, or the, the metal part of the cartridge is, so it's called low brass, and then you can see higher brass here. That's buckshot, like we saw, bigger pellets, and then a slug, which is a type of shotgun round that is a single object, a, a single projectile, very much like a rifle. Um, for reference purposes, because these birdshot rounds are so small and they don't pack tightly in the barrel they lose a lot of energy when they're fired they have rev they have relatively low velocity uh, they're still a high velocity round when they leave the barrel but through multiple repeated tests it's been determined that it is very unlikely for a birdshot like this to penetrate more than two sheets of drywall and with any distance from the drywall and when it's first fired it will likely not penetrate two sheets of drywall so there's been a lot of interesting tests with these where they've noted that at a six to eight foot distance from the victim, somebody shot in at the chest, you know, shot in the chest with a birdshot round six to eight feet away, the pellets didn't even penetrate into the thorax. They were they remained in the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and muscle of the chest. Now the amount of subcutaneous tissue and the amount of muscle mass and development will play a huge role in that. So this isn't like, oh yeah, I'm not I'm not fat, I'm bulletproof. Okay, yeah, there's a kind of a theory there, but at a certain distance, it will still penetrate. But for a lot of patients, you might find that with birdshot, you have very superficial wounds. Whereas with a slug, that round may travel all the way through the body, causing an entrance and an exit wound. Buckshot is called buckshot because it used to be used to hunt deer with. It is a very lethal round at range. So, and they would shoot multiple, so they didn't have to be precise or accurate with their shot. So that gives you some examples, some perspective on the various rounds. So what do you want to know? Was it a pistol, a rifle, or a shotgun round? That's uh, some of your more important bits of information there. Then after that, how far away was the patient from the round? You know, was it point blank? Was it really close? With it, meaning it still has a lot of its energy? Or was it a ricochet round or a long distance round that may have lost a lot of energy before it hit because it like i was talking about with the shotgun rounds it doesn't take a whole lot of distance before those rounds don't actually cause damage anymore and then what did it strike what did the round hit you know somebody gets hit in the lower leg it may not be nearly of a near as much of a concern as if they were hit in the torso and then people who were hit in the abdomen the round tends to go um right through whereas when it they get hit in like the shoulder bones or something like that it slows the bullet down and the bullet uh, will 
in leave or uh, transfer more of its energy to the tissue. So you want to look at where they got hit. A lot of the information on this slide is just really poorly presented and rather inaccurate. Um, so I, I say don't even worry about it. I mean, yeah, it's just kind of like, yeah, forget it. Don't really need to worry about ballistics, but ballistics uh, specifically relating to firearms is um, how does the bullet travel or how does the projectile travel through the air? So if you hear people talking about the ballistics of this round or the ballistics of that, they're talking about how the round travels through the air. Automatic can be fully or semi-automatic. Semi-automatic, you know, you pull the trigger, one round is fired. Um, and then it reloads itself. You have to pull the trigger again for another round to be fired. Fully automatic is like what the military uses with machine guns, where you, as long as you're holding the trigger, it continues to fire. Don't see a whole lot of that um, on the street. Generally, it tends to be more your semi-automatic uh, weapons. But there's creative people out there who, uh, you know, they will, they're gonna get what they want. All right, so this is definitely the most important factor. This is what you need to be worried about the most. Where did the round enter the body and did it exit the body? Frankly, rounds that exit the body, when you have the exit wound, that's really helpful because now you know the trajectory the round took through the body. If you don't have an exit wound, it means that the round has lodged itself somewhere in the body, the body absorbed all the energy from the round, causing significant amount of damage, or you haven't looked hard enough and you're, you've missed the round, the, the exit wound. The exit wound may be hidden, especially if the patient has a large amount of adipose tissue, it's very easy for exit wounds to hide. Um, in folds of the skin. And if there's a lot of adipose tissue, the it can clot or seal off the wound and you don't get a lot of external bleeding, especially if it's a chest wound because there's a lot of open room in that chest cavity for the blood to collect in. So uh, most chest, uh, most GSWs to the chest tend to not have a lot of external bleeding, very, very little external bleeding. Uh, the abdomen on the other hand tends to have quite a bit of external bleeding. Um, so, entrance wound, as you can see, it blows the wound out, but it tends to have a, um, a hole about the size of the round, maybe a little bit more larger, but tends to be very similar in the si to the size of the projectile. Um, we've already kind of talked about this. Bone is very dense. It will shatter when it's hit with a bullet. Uh, hollow organs will compress and the energy will pass right through it. Very little damage. It tends to not even rupture. They'll just pierce it. Um, and then, but uh, solid organs, they will burst. Um, they will split apart because the cavitation, which is the pressure wave that travels through the tissue behind the bullet, that energy wave, it tends to expand out the tissue and causes the um, causing the tissue to explode or the organ to explode or burst, frankly. All right, um, so the tissue that is removed by the projectile, it's put, cut or pushed or crushed out of the way, however you want to say it, that's called the permanent cavity. That's the hole straight through. If you ever watched like a, a crime show or a medical show where they like medical examiners or whatever, they like to put the stick through the wound and see like it comes in here and goes out there they're just showing the wound path that's the permanent cavity and that actually is the least of our concern the the temporary cavity is where the tissue behind it is expanded out due to that pressure wave and causing a lot more uh, problems that temporary cavity is what we're looking for and being concerned about um, for the bigger tissue damage then you can see exit wounds um, tend to be a lot larger than the entrance wound, but it depends again on the type of um, round it is. A full metal jacket, the exit wound will really be about the same size, whereas a um, um, hollow point will have a much smaller um, or much larger, excuse me, much larger exit wound. <clears throat> 
All right, so the rest of this in information, fair, frankly, is not that inf important. I've already kind of given you the info you need on shotgun wounds. Um, another example of a shotgun wound, uh, ran a call for a woman who was shot in the back of the leg with a shotgun, um, bird shot. Uh, what had happened is a uh, her husband was trying to shoot squirrels in the front yard, and she was walking in front of him. He's holding the gun. He's got it slung up under his arm, and he's pointing it at the ground in front of him, and he's walking. He tripped over a um, stone in the front yard and uh, pulled the trigger on the shotgun, which fired, hit the uh, driveway. The round went straight down into the ground, hit the driveway, and then ricocheted up into the back of her calf. So she wasn't even hit with the direct blow of the shotgun. It was the ricochet of the pellets all in her back, back of her calf. She described it a lot like having a bunch of bees stinging her leg constantly. Um, very painful for her. Um, we told her to get the pellets once they were removed, put them in a little film container or a medicine bottle, and anytime she needed a facial or a massage or wanted something from the store to just shake them in front of her husband and that he'd owe her anything for the rest of their life. But she got a kick out of that. But it was a very honest uh, accident, just a very crazy mistake. But what could he have done to avoid it? Not walked with his finger on the trigger. That was his that was his problem. He had he could have tripped without a finger on the trigger and it would not have gone off. But also if you go to a hunting class they'll tell you if you're not the front in the line, point the gun up to the side. Only the person in the front of the line should point point the gun down. All right. Um so there's your info, kind of a reiteration of what I said earlier. What type of weapon was used, how far away was it fired, and what type of bullet? Was it full metal jacket, hollow point, or shotgun round? Uh, powder residue, burns, tissue burns, and uh, black sooty powder um, residue on the t around the entrance wound would indicate that it was a very close um, range round. A, um, and then we already kind of talked about exit wounds. All right, so blast injuries. Um, blast injuries are a wide category of injuries. They can encompass a number of different things here. We're, and we're not talking about things that are just from a bomb. This could be a overpressurization of um, a tank or any number of concern things that can cause an explosion. It doesn't even have to be a fire or um, you know, a, an explosive material it can be like an overpressurization. One of the big things to re remember with blast injuries is when they take place indoors, they tend to have a much greater impact on the person that's in the area because the structure of the building will com um, magnify the concussion. It So the pressure wave hits the walls and then bounces back. And so more energy will be exerted on the body on the, of the victims versus when the explosion is in an open air environment where it can dissipate in all directions and they're only feeling the concussion of the pressure wave that is directed dire towards them. It's not going to reverberate in the one all other directions hitting them. So most of the time, your primary, well, excuse me, your primary blast injuries are going to be caused by the pressure wave, the initial concussive wave um, from the explosion. This is going to injure, for the most part, your hollow organs. So your tympanic membrane, it might pop your lungs, it might hurt, injure your sinuses, it might damage your GI tract or your stomach but that's where most of your problem will exist. Now, at close enough range and high enough intensity, the, the blast, that pressure wave, the primary blast injuries can be lethal. They can cause damage to solid organs as well, rupturing things like your liver and your spleen, shaking your brain too much, causing brain damage and things like that. So they can be uh, lethal, but most of the time they're just gonna pop your eardrums and stuff like that. All right, so secondary blast injuries. This is from debris that was moved or flying from the explosion. Generally, we would call this like shrapnel if it was a bomb or something like that. But if it was a 
pressurized tank that exploded, you know, like a, a gas tank, a propane tank, that ex that projectile of the material of the tank flying towards you would create the secondary injuries. Tertiary, third level or third blast injuries, this is where that pressure wave picked you up off the ground and threw you or hurled you against some other move um solid or hard object with you know whether it was a tree the ground a rock a wall or something like that you get thrown against something so that pressure injury the prime the pressure wave causes the primary blast injury of popping your eardrum in your lungs but then picks your body up and throws it against a hard surface and you break bones or cause blunt trauma to uh, your solid organs from hitting that um, solid object your quaternary or your fourth level, um, this is when that solid object that you hit then falls down on top of you. So you hit the wall and then the wall fell on top of you. But this could also include, as you can see, burns. So let's say something was on fire or there was a level of fire and heat coming from the explosion. Yeah, that caused a burn to you. The crush injury would be the wall toppling, toppling on you or entrapment from that or something along those lines. The respiratory injuries are common during an explosion, or especially a large explosion because of the dust that's kicked up and then the inhaling that dust or from the heat, inhaling the heat and having those airway burns or from the, and in, in some unique cases, the blast actually consumes all the oxygen in the immediate environment. And so there's a temporary suffocation or temporary lack of oxygen in the air until new air moves in. Um, that's, that requires an incredibly large explosion for it to be significant or for any period of time. All right, the quintanary, this is the fifth level, most uncommon. Uh, as you can see, this is going to be biologic, chemical, radioactive, some other contaminant or something else was being dispersed by the explosion. Um, Again, this tends to be nefarious. Their, their intention was to cause a problem versus like an accidental explosion. It's very rare. However, in the industrial and agricultural environments, it is possible that the exploding material or the explosion could release a chemical from the industrial plant or from the agriculture, whether it was a fertilizer or a um, pesticide of some sort. Ammonium nitrate is a common fertilizer used um, in granular form, but it comes in a liquid form called anhydrous ammonia. It is explosive, and if it was to dis uh, be dis um, dispersed, that's the word I was looking for, dispersed, it can cause a lot of asphyxiation and respiratory problems and is lethal. Another example would be if the um, pesticides that were being used that you would normally use to spray on bugs are then released by the accidental explosion of I don't know what I'm you know very hypothetical here that pesticide cloud could call, works like a nerve gas is a ner similar to nerve agents where you have the sludgeum um, symptoms but those would be quaternary blast injury or excuse me quaternary blast injuries um, and it doesn't have to be as dramatic as a radioactive or dirty bomb contaminant. So, of course, the further and further away you get, I, see, I don't really like this image per se because it's trying to show you, it, it makes it look like the five different levels are based on how far you were from the explosion, which is somewhat possible, but not necessarily true. It's, it, they're on, they could all happen at various ranges depending on the size of the explosion so mostly just no but i would you need to know those five levels i know national registry likes to talk about those our tests like to bring those up uh, phtls is going to bring those up so be familiar with those five blast injuries all right so what is an explosion? It is a sudden rapid release of a large quantity of gas. And by rapid, we mean like instantaneous release. Um, propellants can be used. Oftentimes, the material used to create the explosion would burn under normal conditions, 
and um, in a rather controlled manner, but is only exploding because the pressure was built up to the point that the container it was in ruptured, releasing all of the pressure at once. And so that's what causes the explosion. This is why you can get um, accidental explosions from overpressurization and stuff like in a structure, in a re you know, in a chemical factory, or in the um, industrial settings or even like in a pool appliance cest, cest, or not appliance uh, the mechanical room of a swimming pool or something like that where they have pressure tanks and things those could rupture resulting in a sudden release uh, boilers used to explode if they were over pressurized um, we don't use that style of heating very often anymore so we don't see boiler explosions but it's still a possibility in certain areas <laughs> Uh, I think this stuff kind of goes without saying. I don't really know that we need to um, spend much time on that. Got to refill my cup. All right. Um, I already mentioned reflecting surfaces earlier, kind of describing how, like, in a room where the pressure wave bounces off the walls and is imp amplified in that sense. All right, I uh, mentioned this already. It, lungs, ears, um, any hollow organ can be t uh, at risk from a blast injury and from that uh, pressure change. Uh, something to keep in mind is if your tympanic membranes rupture, they are tend to be very painful. It is a temporary loss of hearing or dull, dulling of the hearing. It's not a complete, rarely is it a complete loss of hearing and they tend to heal spontaneously. Or are at least expected to heal spontaneously. All right. Um, yeah, I kind of went through all this when we discussed it, or when I described the five uh, in categories of injuries. All right, so it is important to note there was an explosion. Unless it's very evident what the explosion is, it should be considered the, the possibility of this being an intentional act, a criminal act, is sh or should be considered and should be kept at the forefront of your mind when it comes to scene safety. And so entering that scene and in being in that environment without it being checked is putting yourself at risk. Most of the time, these are quickly handled and quickly evaluated by law enforcement and such, but the incidents or at least the risk of secondary explosions always exist when it was a uh, intentionally set explosion. Accidental explosions are completely different things. So give careful consideration to why was there an explosion here? Where are we? Are we in an industrial, agricultural, rural environment? Even in a neighborhood, like behind a residence or something, these tend to be very um, accidental versus being in a subway station or in a stadium or in a busy uh, intersection in town, something in a, in a city. Look at the environment. Would this be the type of location that a criminal would want to uh, detonate a bomb versus this is very likely an accidental explosion. Those are things to consider when looking at, uh, when um, evaluating your scene safety. After that, our, t our treatment and care for the patients from blast injuries will be very similar to all other traumas. We'll do the standard um, assessment practice, trauma assessment of practice, look for DCAP BATLS and, you know, primary survey, secondary survey kind of a thing. Um, it is important, though, to continue to monitor breath sounds since blast injuries tend to injure hollow organs, lung-filled organs. The pneumothorax may not have been present initially, but it will de could develop and should be monitored. All right, scene size up in here is going to be very, or excuse me, the patient assessment here is going to be very, very similar to the way it was for our last unit. Um, but I'm going to get, I need to go get some more water. So let's give you a really quick break. Please don't disappear this time. And then we'll get started on this. So patient assessment and scene size up and during trauma incidences. Obviously, PPE, trauma tends to be bloodier, so 
Um, eyewear or face protection is generally a, a good idea, something you want to consider early, early on or anticipate the need for. Uh, it's not normally one that we have time to get gowns or even have gowns available, but if it's particularly bloody and you know it, you know, expecting it, then gown up if you can. Um, the rest of this, the helmets, the uh, coats, boots, this all depends on the type of trauma that you're getting into. If you're dealing with a car wreck or something like that, you should not be in or near the damaged vehicles without adequate PPE. If you don't have bunker gear or rest, um, extrication gear of some sort, it is best that you stay away from the hot zone, stay away from the damaged vehicles, and have the those with that gear bring the uh, victim to you. Um, I think one of the important things to remember and to keep in mind with trauma patients is trauma and injury has taken place. That means there were, re at a very recent time, conditions on that scene that caused injury. Ensure that those conditions don't are, are, no, are no longer present. You know, if it's something they tripped and fell or they fell off a ladder, well, that's pretty easy like to make sure. But if it was an electrocution, if it was a car wreck, if it was a, um, yeah, a gunshot wound, I mean, any number of other types of trauma, make certain that the cause of that trauma no longer exists as a risk to you. Um, mechanism of injury, while it doesn't necessarily dictate where and how we transport the patient, it should tell us where to start looking for injuries. As we are kind of going through already, what type of injuries would we expect to see from various mechanisms? Um, and does spinal cord immobilization, is spinal cord immobilization required? Not all trauma requires C-spine long um, control and long boards but it's it is common even though we are getting away from it and if c-spine is net control is necessary use your jaw thrust maneuver for the airway if the jaw thrust maneuver does not effectively open the airway you can use the head tilt chin lift do not um sacrifice their breathing because you're trying to protect their uh neck let the let damage happen to the neck because you needed to held tilt chin lift in order to open their airway but our approach needs to in you know we get their general impression the only thing i would change about the way this is written is there should we should look for any major bleeding or exsanguinating hemorrhages before we open the airway as we approach as we're looking at our general impression and when by exsanguinating hemorrhage i'm talking spurting arterial bleeding a large uh, venous bleed, not what we're worried about. A large, you know, road rash or something like that, not what we're worried about. What you're looking at is bright red spurting blood or a large quantity of blood on the ground. If blood bleeding like that is present, you stop the bleeding or control that bleeding as quickly as possible and then open the airway. The theory there is if you allow them to bleed, bleed while opening their airway and dealing with their their breathing there won't be any blood left to carry the oxygen you're trying to get into their body and so we stop the bleeding first to um, conserve as many red blood cells as possible and then open their airway and ventilate them All right, when assessing breathing, this is not simply counting the rates. This is looking for chest trauma. One of the few areas on the body that we will do a pretty good evaluation of trauma in that during our primary survey is the chest because any trauma to the chest can have a negative impact on breathing, whether it's penetrating, blunt, um, rib fractures, or flail segments, or any of these. You want to make certain that there, or you want to look for those injuries and be able to intervene on them as quickly as possible. A pneumothorax or even a uh, flail segment, these can be life threatening conditions that we need to stabilize or deal with immediately. And we'll get into more specifics on those later on. 
when dealing with trauma, especially multi-system trauma or any kind of significant trauma, time is of the essence. Our focus should not be worrying about, well, is the heart rate 90 or 100 or 100 versus 110? It needs to be, is it fast, is it slow, is it normal? Is it strong, is it weak, is it regular? Do we have it in uh, the radials or is it only in the carotid? You know, Where do we see this pulse? That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. Um, if you have one patient only, well, then you may end up doing CPR if the patient is pulseless. If you have multiple traumas at the same time, a patient who is pulseless on scene is not going, you're not going to have the personnel to deal with that. So you're going to triage um, that patient to um, expectant or dead. But cap refill is a great indication of early skin function or our circulatory status, you know, if they have cap refill in their fingers or something like that. And then disability, this is getting that AVPU, the mental status, um, looking at their GCS, um, what is their motor sensory function, just, you know, what's their mental status. And then exposing the patient, and this is where you start to do a quick scan for some major injuries. Do we have reason to believe that they have a fractured pelvis or a major long bone fracture? that we should be aware of before packaging. This is not a detailed head to toe. This is an extremely quick survey of the body to identify the likelihood of a, of a major injury that will be complicated by our packaging of the patient. So uh, we're not doing that meticulous bit by bit, checking every quadrant and the whole back and all nine yards. We're, we're just doing a quick survey, quick scan on the body. This entire primary survey, if you don't have like a major issue like a occluded airway or a flail segment or a pneumothorax to deal with, this entire thing should take matters of seconds, like 30 seconds, 60 seconds at the most to do that primary survey and then know whether you have a critical patient and whether you're going to transport them urgently or if you're going to have time before getting to the facility or transporting. <laughs> So, when would you transport immediate? When would you call this a critical? So, multi-system traumas, you know, um, altered mental status, anything that's airway or breathing, so occluded airway or chest trauma, um, anything that's major airway comp or circulation compromise. If those ABCs are affected at all, this constitutes a critical patient that we need to get and get gone. All right, um, platinum 10 minutes. 10 minutes on scene. When you have a major trauma, any type of major or significant trauma, do not remain on scene longer than 10 minutes. What is the key to getting off of scene in a hurry? Practice. Practice is the key. You cannot just expect to be the Hollywood hero who's going to one day show up on scene, rise to the occasion, and having never prepared, suddenly you are capable of having a less than 10 minute scene time. You can't do that without practice. Nothing aggravates me more than seeing a crew sit in the back of an ambulance on scene for 20 minutes and then transport emergency to the hospital or sit on scene for 20 minutes waiting for a helicopter to show up or something. Now, if they have an hour and a half drive, that 20 minutes might make sense. But in my area, we don't have that kind of transport time to a trauma center, and so there's no reason you should be waiting on scene like that. 10 minutes on scene max. You need to be, and time yourself. Do, like, pay attention to your normal scene times with even routine non-emergent calls and such, and see, 10 minutes goes really fast when you're trying to package a patient and load them up and get down the road. But the only way to practice your, or excuse me, the only way to be efficient at doing your skills in route, like your IVs, your vital signs, and all that kind of stuff, is to practice them on your non-emergent calls. When you're running your calls um, that there's no rush, do them in route. Get your IV in route. Get your vitals in route. N learn to work alone. Learn to... Um, do that kind of stuff on the way. That's what you should be doing. Assessing, treating, and dealing, uh, interacting with your patient. Not just sitting there behind them, typing on a uh, tough book um, and doing your paperwork. So that routine practice and experience is what will prepare you for the severe calls when time is of the essence. <laughs>
All right. Transport of your patient should never be delayed for history taking, but anytime it's possible to get history, like let's say you have a 10 minute scene time, if there's an extra crew member, a firefighter, or even a law enforcement officer or something, that you can have them go get some history on the patient, name, birth date, meds, um, medical history, any anything like that can be useful. Again, don't delay care of the patient. And if the patient isn't in need of ALS care at that moment, you can have some BLS partner, your BLS partner or some firefighters or whatever, they can be packaging the patient while you obtain some of that history data from a bystander or family member or somebody on scene. You may, um, but there may not be anybody available and the patient might be altered and you can't do that. However, never delay transport trying to get the history. Uh, in my department, I'm fortunate to work with crews that I work with quite regularly. I know them, we, you know, we see each other, we have each other's phone numbers. So it is not uncommon on a bad trauma, excuse me, for me to transport the patient off the scene and have somebody that I know is remaining on the scene text me pertinent data or information that I needed you know to gather that info before I or while I'm transporting that way by the time I get to the hospital I have the pertinent data but I didn't delay transport on that trauma patient for, um, waiting to find out what meds they took or something like that it is necessary to be considerate of HIPAA in that case and make sure that that data is not stored in a non-secured manner. Um, but I feel like I'm going to sneeze. I'm trying not to. All right. So your complete set of vital signs and your history, taking sample history, OPQRST, those are all the first part of the secondary assessment. If you get down to your patient and you're like, hey, how are you? What's going on? And they answer you, you've done your primary. Your airway breathing circulation is done. All you have to do really now is check for a pulse and confirm, you know, get the basic details about that. But your primary survey could have been done in one question. So you might launch into your secondary assessment and get your history taken really, really quick. But on a more severe patient, it might take a little bit longer before you get to secondary. There's nothing wrong with not doing the secondary during transport. If you have spent the entire time, and I think this is an important detail that people forget, if you have spent your entire time doing primary assessment issues, controlling major bleeds, opening or maintaining airways, breathing for the patient, maintaining circulation in one way or the other, if you take all your time doing that and you don't get to a secondary head to toe, that's okay. Now, if your patient was relatively minor, you were completed your air, your uh, primary, controlled everything just fine, and then you um, choose not to do a secondary because you didn't want to. Well, that's a little inexcusable. That you don't have a reason for that. But when necessary, or when you are still working on your primary, don't. Um, don't worry if you don't get a secondary a secondary assessment. A few years ago, there was a situation that came out in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I don't remember if I've talked about this one before with you guys, but uh, it was an article posted, I believe it was in GEMS, it was either in GEMS or EMS1, but it was called Death by Protocol. It was a situation where a very, very green, like six month on the job EMT basic was working on a BLS ambulance with another EMT basic and responded to a multiple gunshot wounds incident. The six, the, um, six month experienced EMT was transporting a 16 year old male with multiple GSWs to the tor um, on his body to the local trauma center. Now, I don't know the circumstances. I don't know the setup of Cincinnati Fire Department and why they had uh, don't have ALS or not, but that's frankly irrelevant for this type of a call. The EMT determined that there were certain injuries on this patient that required continual care and continual direct pressure and that weren't controlled through the use of tourniquets or other, I don't know if he had them or not, but anyway, the patient required constant direct pressure to maintain these um, injuries. However, this same EMT had recently been 
reprimanded in a written reprimand by the department for transporting a patient to the same hospital without calling in the radio report and not having a full set of vitals. So during transport, the EMT took his hands off of the direct pressure, off of the controlling of the bleeding in order to obtain a full set of vitals and con call the trauma center with the radio report. Upon arrival at the trauma center, the patient had bled out and was dead. Now, what did the EMT do wrong? Or was the EMT wrong? He had been reprimanded for showing up at the hospital without calling a report and without getting a full set of vitals, but here he shows up at the hospital having called the report, having obtained a full set of vitals, and his patient was dead. So what's the difference? This is why they called it death by protocol. Per protocol, they couldn't actually go after the EMT because he followed the protocol. However, it did have a negative impact on the, on the patient. So what I'm pointing out to you is our care and treatment must be done in what is the patient's, in what is the patient's best interest. If your patient requires direct pressure to control the bleeding, you give the direct pressure. You don't take your hands off that bleeding in order to call a radio report. The hospital can get over it. And you can most respectfully look at your supervisor and said, I understand that that violated protocol, but if I didn't do it, the patient would die. And so that's why I chose to hold direct pressure and not call the report. This isn't something that you're going to do lightly. This isn't something that you're going to want to do when you're, uh, you know, out of attitude or something like that. This is something you can clearly show this was the patient's best interest. Not, a, well, I didn't call a report because I knew they were going to divert me. That's not appropriate. That's not patient's best interest. We're talking your hands were busy and you never got to call the report. Another thing to consider is, have your partner call the report. They're driving, yes, it's not ideal. They don't have all the information, but they could call in and say, look, we're on the way to your hospital with a patient who's bleeding so bad we can't take our hands off them. So I don't have any vitals, we'll be there in a few minutes. Like that's the kind of situation that you can, the information or report they can give. Another situation is, why not take another rider? Why not have a third person or at least a second person in the back of the ambulance with you to help? That is That should be considered. Now, limited personnel on scene may prohibit that. I've definitely worked in those environments before, but it's something to consider. When you're trying to do your secondary assessment, have you confirmed that your entire primary is done and that nothing's going to suffer because of it? Or is there... Um, have you completed your entire primary and you should do your secondary. Make certain that you don't uh, neglect it in those situations. So, vital signs are the very first part of your secondary assessment. This is where you're actually going to get the count of respirations of pulse, blood pressure, and things like that. Whereas before you were just looking for fast, slow, and weak, strong kind of a thing. This is where your head to toe will be done in a very systematic and very slow and methodical manner. You're going to start the head looking for lacerations, look, looking for any type of trauma, decap BTLS, move down to the face, then the neck, shoulders, chest, abdomen, pelvis, genitals, lower extremities, pulses, motor sensory function, upper extremities, pulse motor sensory function and move in that order. I always move in the same order. I always document it in the same order. That way, when I'm doing the call, I never miss something. If you're jumping from head to feet, to legs, to arms, to abdomen, to, you're gonna miss something. You're, you're gonna forget something. But if you're always starting in a complete order and using the same order every time, you will be consistent and you won't forget anything. I prefer to start head to toe. It's taught to start head to toe because injuries around the head, neck, and chest tend to be what kill you the fastest. So you wanna identify those first before you get to the things around the feet and the arms and hands because those are the least concerning. When inspecting, you're gonna look and you're gonna palpate, you're gonna to touch, you're going to auscultate with your stethoscope. Um, there's no reason to worry about auscultating your abdominal sounds, GI sounds and such like that, but uh, you will palpate the abdomen for tenderness, for rigidity, um, 
and things like that. It is recommended that you auscultate heart tones as well as lung sounds. Your stethoscope's on their chest. You're looking, listening to their lungs. Go ahead and listen to their heart. We're not asking you to recognize the presence of an S3 or an S4. We're asking you to say, do we have heart tones and what do they sound like? Then as you reassess throughout the call, if they're becoming muffled due to the presence of a pericardial tamponade or a hemothorax, you will recognize that. It's getting that baseline. PMS is important, but also it's necessary to consider that PMS should be evaluated prior to long boarding or splinting a patient. You want to make certain that your splinting or your uh, remobilization methods are not creating a larger problem. The back is probably one area that you will be a little bit slower and more detailed during your packaging because you roll them to get them onto a longboard. You want to get a good look at that back. You're not going to roll them again in the ambulance. So try to get a really good view of that back. Uh, something to consider, I was doing scenarios with students one time. We were doing student-led, student-created scenarios. And this group of students created it, um, had a scenario where the male was shot, uh, a gunshot wound to the chest interior entrance wound and they were looking for the exit wound um, they rolled him on his side scanned his whole back uh, the male that they used as their patient was a very large individual and they found no gunshot wound what they didn't realize is that the gunshot wound on his back had been placed right on his side in the posterior axillary line under and when they rolled him, they rolled him onto the gunshot wound, scanned what they could, rolled him back over, and did not visualize that one area of his back. So when they rolled him, they actually covered up the wound and never went back and reassessed that area. So be very cautious when you're doing your scans on the back to make certain you've checked every square inch especially on your large patients where there may be folds of skin you need to look up under those folds of skin or when you're rolling them on their side you may be covering things up that you didn't um, yeah you may be covering things up that you've missed all right reassessment every five minutes for a patient who is um, um, unstable or in severe you know condition or every 15 minutes for the stable patients um, stable patients so they got good blood pressure they got a good heart rate all this stuff M simple traumas anything like that multi-system traumas rapid heart rates altered mental status rapid respiratory rate these would indicate a reassessment every five minutes you need to be and reassessment here is not simply hitting the NIBP button again we're gonna do a lot more than that you want to do your head to toe again to make certain that or to reevaluate the injuries or the areas specifically where no injury was noted before if their leg or their pelvis was broken the first time you assessed it it's still going to be broken the second time it didn't heal magically so there's no reason to check that again what you're looking for are the parts of their body that you didn't find a problem maybe you palpated the abdomen and it was okay well each reassessment you need to do it again to make sure rigidity or tenderness isn't developing same with the lungs or something like that look for swelling on blunt force trauma to extremities that might develop during um, with time that wasn't noted the first time around. But any injured um, area that was found the first time, there's no reason to manipulate it, touch it, or aggravate it, causing more pain and discomfort on a reassessment. It was broken the first time, it's broken the second time. The only exception, the one exception to that might be is if you were bandaging a significant bleed, you wanna make sure that that bandage is still tight and controlling the bleed and that they're not um, leaking through or you know still bleeding actively you just can't see it the hardest ones to check for that are the lacerations on the back of the head or even on the top of the head with dark haired patients where the blood or at least for me because I'm colorblind you know, blood blends in and I can't tell the difference and it's all running down the back of their neck and pooling on their back on the board and you don't notice it until it's run off the side of the board because you thought you had the head wound bandaged you thought you had it controlled but part of it came loose or it's bled, it's, um, bled through and you couldn't see it because their head was down covering it. Hey, Amanda. <laughs> 
You don't look like you're paying attention, and neither do the girls behind you. You are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Y'all in that Snatch Chat and Instagram. All right, so trauma scores are not commonly used in the pre-hospital environment because it, um, it has less of a relevance to what we're worried about, what we're trying to do. Trauma scores are very commonly used in the trauma center as a predictor of the patient's outcome and, whether, and their survivability of the injuries. As you can see, cap refill time, systolic blood pressure, respiratory expansion, which is one of the big things that we can't um, evaluate or have a hard time evaluating pre-hospital, along with respiratory rate and GCS. That's what makes your trauma score used for identifying survival. Now, the we know GCS. We should do GCS every time. Never transport a patient to a trauma center without a GCS. I guarantee you a trauma center will ask you for a GCS and a blood sugar if you tell them you're en route. <laughs> Uh, trauma, our national registry, I guarantee we'll have GCS questions. Your PHTLS will be full of GCS questions. Memorize it, know it, be familiar with GCS. Now, the revised trauma score is used more or more effective in the pre-hospital environment. Again, it's all about uh, severity of head injuries and its information is less relevant to what we're doing because we're still loading and going and getting to you know bright lights cold steel so the trauma score doesn't really give us a lot more that we needed you know it's not going to tell us something we didn't already know the patient's in a bad way but it uses just their gcs systolic blood pressure and respiratory rate and that is the revised trauma score again probably aren't going to do either of these very often in the pre-hospital environment so this is your re revised trauma score showing what your values are. So you can see any blood pressure above 89, any respiratory rate between 10 and 29. So that's quite the range. Um, that's a, a value of four. So that's pretty good. Um, patient's gonna be pretty good, healthy there. As you can see, you gotta be pretty messed up to get a low uh, trauma score. Did you say we need to memorize the revised trauma score? No, you do not need to memorize the revised trauma score. You need to memorize the GCS. Okay. But you do not need to memorize the revised trauma score. I would know I would know what it's used for. Like what what is the revised trauma score used for, but you don't need to know how to calculate it. All right, so what do we do for trauma? How do we treat trauma? Well, it starts with, like we've said, airway, breathing, circulation. Do we give oxygen to trauma patients? Yes, we should, because oftentimes trauma involves blood loss. And when you have a loss of blood, you have a reduction in your oxygen carrying capacity. So we want to increase the amount of oxygen dissolved into their plasma in, a, in order to maximize the oxygenation to the core and to your vital organs. Ex um, elevating your extremities, specifically the feet and um, lower legs, can be very helpful to use gravity to push their blood back down into their core. This is not Trendelenburg. I want to make that incredibly clear. I think we've, I don't know that we've done this in person, but this will happen during our uh, uh, trauma practical day. Trendelenburg is taking the entire person, you know, they're on the backboard or something like this, and tilting the entire bed head down, like so. That's Trendelenburg, when their entire abdominal contents and all that are pushing down against their abdomen. Shock position or elevating their extremities, that is a matter of simply raising their legs. Let's see. Uh, versus shock. All right. So where'd my screen go? There it is. 
So here's an example of what Trendelenburg looks like. The entire body, as you can see, is inverted with the feet up. This means that the abdominal contents are being pushed against the diaphragm. Every time this patient is trying to take a breath, that diaphragm has to lift all of the abdominal contents up out of the way in order to do so. Now, that might not seem like a big deal for this patient, and it probably isn't, but it will still eventually result in tiring. But you get a large patient, an obese patient or something like that, and that's a whole lot of abdominal contents and body, um, you know, like this patient, that's a lot of weight that that diaphragm has to lift out of the way. And the diaphragm will very quickly tire and um, resulting in decreased oxygenation decreased tidal volume um i don't i think that i can't tell quite for sure but i think this is the idea yeah it kind of gets you that well that's stirrups i'm not really sure what on earth they're accomplishing here but you can see um i feel like they should be wearing black leather and you know stuff like that instead of uh, blue scrubs but you can see that would become a very uncomfortable position after a while. That diaphragm would really tire itself out trying to breathe. So we don't recommend the Trendelenburg position like this anymore. We now, but we still recommend the shock position. And the shock position, is, so this is Trendelenburg. See how the patient is on a uh, backboard and you've raised the feet of the stretcher up? That created Trendelenburg which we should avoid. But this patient, see how they're not on a backboard? Their head, their torso and head is flat, but their feet are raised, that's the shock position. So there's nothing wrong with raising your patient's feet, as a really small picture, you know, doing something along these lines. Why on earth does it have to be naked? Here's a good example. Um, Notice you're keeping the patient's feet elevated, but their torso is still horizontal. You're not um, inverting the torso like this. So Trendelenburg, no. But shock position, yes. We will perform the shock position on a patient um, in the ambulance. Now let's say this patient is on a long backboard. What are you gonna do for them? Well, I know that we're supposed to keep them lying flat on the backboard, but you might put a pillow or something underneath their feet, underneath their legs, loosen that ankle strap and raise their legs up a little bit like this in order to elevate it. That might be helpful in this case. Um, some people argue that the small amount of change that you're gonna get is not going to be significant. If my patient, if I'm concerned about my patient having a neck injury and not worried about a long or a lumbar injury as much, then I'll be a lot more willing to do this. If I have a concern of a lumbar injury, then I'm going to be a lot more hesitant to move their legs. Um, you really want to consider what you're going for here. But back injuries or not, if they, if their brain is hypoxic due to a lack of blood flow, it doesn't matter if they have a back injury. They're not going to have any form of recovery because of the brain injury. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're evaluating or trying to decide what to do for your patient. So keep the patient supine, maybe elevate their legs and um, transport rapidly to bright lights and cold steel. All right, so um, fluid resuscitation. This topic came up the other day, and hey, we got a new recruit. What's up, dude? So we talked about fluid resuscitation a little bit the other day in class. Um, what is the fluid resuscitation that we shoot for? What's our formula for that? 
20 milliliters per kilogram. 20 milliliters per kilogram is the intention. Now, that 20 milliliters per kilogram might be given in individual uh, segments or steps of 250 milliliters, but generally, if you're dealing with a shock patient, 250 milliliters of fluid is not, uh, is nothing. Recall, within 20 minutes of giving fluids, two-thirds of the fluids will have shifted out of their vasculature into their interstitial and intercellular space. So when we replace fluid lost, if a patient loses 500 milliliters of fluid, we need to replace it with 1,500 milliliters of fluid. Or they say I, they lose 500 milliliters of blood, we need to replace it with 1,500 milliliters of fluid. So 250 milliliters is rarely going to be enough for this patient. While we may do 250 if we're suspecting a cardiogenic shock for hemophoragic shock we really want to push fluid so 20 milliliter per kilogram boluses is where we're going to start our goal our intention is to replace um or to maintain blood pressure. So we can determine that through mental status, through the presence of radial pulses. As long as we have a radial pulse, we're, we know we're good. Um, frankly, by the time you've lost a radial pulse, you're pretty much gone. Like you, you're, you're way beyond, and you're, you're in the realm of irreversible shock where the patient's gonna develop mods or some type of um, DIC or secondary conditions as a result of the trauma. So, but maintain that minimum blood pressure of 90 systolic. If they have internal bleeding, you can go a little higher than that if you've controlled the external bleeding. So team approach, multiple people working on the same patient at the same time. You got different people trying to intervene. We got somebody working on an IV. We got somebody trying to main, uh, monitor and maintain vitals or continue to keep track of vitals, as well as um, the... Um, the word I'm looking for uh, stabilizing and mobilizing wounds um, bandaging wounds is, is stabilizing joints and injuries and things like that now here are your three major aspects of death in trauma we under we think bleeding out but what does that lead to well when they bleed out excessively we've talked about how shock results in the coagulopathies the inability to clot the dic that comes from it but also the acidosis due to the inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissue and with that inadequate oxygen delivery it results in a decreased production of atp which means the patient can't um maintain body temperature and they become hypothermic in what would be otherwise a normal environment you know not an environment you'd be afraid to be naked in well i mean the fact that there's a bunch of professionals hanging around you might make you afraid to be naked but you know it's not what i'm talking about so what can we do for this maintain oxygenation keep them on high flow get make certain that they have the oxygen that they can get you've stopped that bleeding as early as possible to conserve as many of these uh, red blood cells as we can but the big thing is keep them warm while we do need to do trauma naked we do need to make sure we've done a complete head to toe assessment and identified all injuries we also want to ensure that we've covered them back up that we've maintained their um, body temp and things like that so that they because that hypothermia is only going to complicate things we might not be able to avoid the coagulopathy that is a very difficult thing to have to control since the cause of that and the damage for that generally happens before we even get there but we can prevent and reverse hypothermia and we can we can do our best to prevent acidosis by maintaining ventilation and oxygenation remember this is a respiratory acidosis caused by inadequate oxygen delivery so the more oxygen we can give them the better off they're going to be in these cases trauma still is one of the areas that we push high flow o2 without being concerned about it all right so i mentioned at the start of this port this lecture that we often will um 
or that we used to use the mechanism of injury as our reason for transport to trauma centers and things like that. That is not completely the case anymore. We've replaced that with a tiered system. This tiered system comes from the CDC recommendation for trauma triage. It's been pushed uh, since I think 2014, I wanna say is when it came out. Anyway, it's been pushed for a while. All the trauma centers have it and use it. Most hospitals have been informed about it, although I'm personally aware of a number of hospitals that don't seem to understand it at all. Um, but the determination of trauma center uh, eligibility should be based on these steps. The first is their physiologic criteria. What are their vital signs? What are they looking like? If their GCS is less than or equal to 13, we need to go to a trauma center. This is indicating a big issue. Systolic blood pressure less than 90, of or less than 90. That obviously should go to a trauma center. I would be pushing going to a trauma center even if it was only 100, but you know, if it's less than 90, they need to go. Respiratory rates less than or above 20, 10, less than 10 or above 29. Again, these patients need to go to a trauma center. And should you take them to the local hospital and then be stabilized to transfer? Probably not. That's something you want to consider, but it's something you should consider very carefully because taking that patient to the local hospital is only going to delay different their eventual treatment and their actual definitive care an, an ex, a uh, excuse me an exception to that is if they have an uncontrollable airway let's say they have a clenched jaw or something they have a lot of blood or vomit in their airway that you can't keep suctioned out you can't establish an et2 because of their clenched jaw that you need paralytics and you don't have that option well going into the local hospital for airway control may be necessary but um but that's like pretty much the only reason you would otherwise you you're going to continue to the trauma center where they will get the best definitive care. All right, so that's your physiologic criteria, and that's pretty simple. You know, three three things to look at. If they don't meet these three vital sign requirements, they probably don't need to go to a trauma center. But some patients maintain really well. So here's your anatomic criteria. If the patient doesn't meet any of the primary or the physiologic excuse me they maybe have these injuries penetrating traumas to head neck torso and extremities so pretty much anywhere right that's everywhere if they have penetrating trauma you're going to a trauma center chest wall instability or deformity okay flail segments fractured ribs stuff like that breathing problem. we're gonna take them to a trauma center two or more long bone fractures now it says proximal long bone fractures this means two femurs or two humeruses or one femur and one humerus this does not mean a tib fib tib fib is not the case a crushed mangled or pulseless extremity you should be going to a trauma center now Crushed mangle or pulseless might mean trauma center, whereas amputation, you may, if it's an isolated amputation, like they cut their hand off with a saw or something like that, that patient isn't necessarily gonna go to the trauma center as much as they'll go to the hospital that specialized with reattachment surgeries, which for your area might be a trauma center, but not necessarily. So um, pelvic fractures, trauma center because of the uh, risk of bleeding. Uh, open and or depressed skull fractures. If it's depressed, give it some Zoloft to see if that helps. But otherwise, um, skull fractures go to the trauma center. And then uh, if it's not depressed or open, you're not gonna know it was a skull fracture. Like a linear skull fracture, you're probably not gonna identify in the field. That's why they're not listed as a reason to go to a trauma center. And then anytime there's paralysis, I would extend that to any time that you have paresthesia, weakness or something like that, or a presumed spinal cord injury, take that to the trauma center as well. All right, now let's say your patient, they had, their vital signs weren't the reason you needed to go, their specific injuries weren't the reason you needed to go, but you're looking at them and they're like, man, this is messed up because of these mechanisms of injury. Notice this is the third level. Can you take them to a trauma center for mechanism? Yes, but why? Well, adults falling greater than 20 feet, children falling greater than 10. Generally, we also consider three times their height. 
adult or child. If it's three times or more their height, take them to the trauma center. That's because their injuries may be significant to need the trauma center, but haven't presented in the physiologic or um, anatomic categories yet. High risk auto impacts. Now, intrusion here to the passenger compartment, we're normally talking 12 inches on the side of the patient or 18 inches on the side that doesn't have the patient. And then anytime there's an ejection, how you're gonna have an ejection that doesn't involve any of the anatomic findings, I don't know, but anyway. Ejections or anything that considers a high-risk injury. Pedestrians or bicycles thrown or run over because of a wreck. Pedestrian accidents, you wanna triage on the high side. But again, I'm not talking about the homeless bum sitting on the corner at the gas station who claims he got hit by the truck mirror that was pulling out of the gas station. I mean, been there, run that call a few times, and you're like, dude, like he wasn't even moving. How did you get hit in the arm by this truck mirror that has no injury or no damage to it? And like you have no injury on your arm. So like that's not necessarily what we're talking about. And then any significant motorcycle crash, but I would say where the patient was on the motorcycle when it crashed. Not, not automatically jumping on this when the patient separated from the motorcycle and did the whole road rash and slide thing. But they might fall into the category of anatomic or physiologic and you want to treat them that, for that. <laughs> or anatomic or, um, yeah, physiologic, I said that right. So... Here are some other considerations. This is the fourth level of consideration for trauma centers um, where unique conditions have been uh, added. Elderly patients over 55, um, young children, very, uh, very, especially young, very young children, any uh, person over 65 with a blood pressure less than 110. This is a newer uh, requirement that's being at, or recommendation that's being added to this. Is they're finding that elderly don't always compensate with their blood pressure the way we expect the younger to and they can and they tend to need a higher blood pressure so you know a blood pressure of 100 might be hypotensive for them whereas for you or I a blood pressure of 90 would be the problem any patient with a bleeding disorder or anticoagulants because of the harder time bleeding they may need the services of the trauma center um, older adults in general, are going to suffer trauma more significantly from what looked like a less severe injury. Always over triage your elderly patients because their bodies will not respond as quick to the changes. They may have significant trauma, but their heart rate hasn't gone up, their blood pressure hasn't changed, their respiratory rate hasn't necessarily changed because of the delay in their body's ability to compensate and react. So um, those are you know things to think about. Uh, burns with other trauma. Now, if it's just burns alone, you go to the burn center. But if there's trauma and burns, is a reason to upgrade to the trauma center. And then the last one is provider judgment. This is when you have decided, based on previous experience, previous uh, calls and of similar nature, that you know what, this is probably going to end up bad. I'm just going to go to be safe. This provider judgment could include, you know, the local hospital, while technically capable, is not going to provide this patient with the care they need in the time they need it, and going to the trauma center will get them definitive care quicker. They may not meet the requirements for the trauma center, but you know that that's going to provide them with the um, fastest route to definitive care, and that, that increased access is going to be have a positive impact on their recovery that could be your reason for provider judgment in which you decide you know what i'm just going to take this patient down to the trauma center just to be safe so another example there um there's a number of different trauma center levels throughout the country you know i mean trauma centers that have these different levels throughout the country we tend to think a lot about the level ones and level twos, and there can be some confusion as to which is or which isn't. Um, one of the big differences between the two is research. In fact, most of the time, the big difference between the level one and two is the level ones are doing more research and studies on their patients um, 
for it. I've heard it said before that their access to neuro um, neurosurgeons is a, is a determining factor among others. Uh, both are supposed to have a neuro facility and have neuro, neuro capabilities, but I believe that the difference between a level one and a level two is that the level one has the neurologist on at the facility 24 seven, whereas the level two the neurologist isn't necessarily always in house. They may have to be called in in the in the event that it's necessary. But um, the yeah, what you should focus on for the level one, two, threes, and fours is how that affects where you transport to and how that affects your transport decision. Not so much what makes the difference between a one, two, three, or four. Um, another thing to point out, if you have a patient who met the physiologic capacity uh, concerns or even the anatomic concerns, those are automatic level one trauma centers or highest level available. If you have a patient who's meeting like your level three, um, your mechanism concerns well you might just go to the level three or the level two that's in the area even the level a lot of your anatomic excuse yeah anatomic concerns could be treated at a level two especially if you're talking about lower extremity injuries and such they don't need a neurosurgeon so level twos would be perfectly fine your level threes probably the concern um if you have a reason to believe that this patient are you know reasonably sub suspicious of a significant mechanism that's what i was trying to say they might you might just take them to the level three or the level four because it's a trauma center it'll be better than a community hospital but it's not going to overload your level one in the system and that's something we should be considering not every trauma patient needs to go to a level one trauma center we if we did that if we took every patient to the trauma center we would overload it and then the patients who really needed the help would have limited access because of the sheer volume of patients, you know, and the staff being busy. So triage them down. If you're taking them on judgment or off of like, well, they're older or this was kind of a significant wreck, even though we can't really find any injuries, that's where you would go to your level threes and maybe your level fours just to make sure that that's a, um, just kind of as patient's best interest, but they're not in a urgent sense needing that level one immediate surgery. So kind of think about it from that standpoint, how quickly will this person, how quickly is this person to need surgery? So there's some breakdowns of the variations. So that kind of explains some of the differences there. Right, so how do we decide how to get this patient to a trauma center? How, what are we going to do here? Well, where are you? How far away are you from the trauma center? What is the current weather and traffic conditions? A, um, if you can drive the patient to the hospital within a half an hour to 40 minutes, generally I think it's a 40 mile distance, you should be able to ground them. That should get you there within the golden hour from the time of trauma. And that's one of the big things to think about. What's your golden hour? When did the trauma happen? And how long will it take you to get to a trauma center? If you are not certain that you can drive them to the trauma center within that golden hour, then it is a, they are a candidate for um, an air transport and you know a helicopter transport or something along those lines. Uh, it is important that you remember though, when choosing a helicopter, that that helicopter has to be dispatched. They have a minimum of um, five, yeah, at least five minutes, sometimes more to get off the ground. You know, first you have to, they have to call them and find out, are you gonna accept this flight? Then once they accept the flight, then they have like five minutes before they can have to be off the ground. Then there's flight time to your scene. Once they get on 
scene, they have a 10 minute scene time, then it's flight time to the trauma center, and most trauma centers put their helicopter pads on the roof, and then the patient has to ride the elevator down to the OR because the OR is not on the roof. So there's a lot of delays there in definitive care. So if you have a patient who's 30, 40 minutes from the hospital, from the trauma center, that helicopter may not actually be faster. Now, when you're dealing with an hour or an hour and a half transport to a hospital, that helicopter is definitely the way to go. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is when do you call the helicopter? If I hear on dispatch the information is remotely concerning that this patient might meet the criteria for a trauma center, I will call a helicopter as early as possible like, while en route. You can always cancel it. And the worst thing you did was let the fl crew fly for the day. They're not going to complain about getting in the helicopter and flying. They're going to be grateful. So if you get on scene, you find out, oh, this was way over dramatized. There's, we don't need to cancel them. No big deal. But it's better to have them on their way and have them there fast when you needed them than to wait for them when you end up needing them. So request them early in the call. You, you should know after your primary survey, you know, you do XABC, you got your initial impression, do XABCDE, you should know, do I need to take this person to a trauma center and are they a critical patient? If they are, keep the helicopter coming, load them up or load up in the car, in the ambulance and go. But um, if they're not, you can cancel them at that point. You know, we're good. We, we, we can ground this one. This is not that urgent. Um, but traffic may be a consideration. You know that normally it takes you 30 minutes to get to a trauma center, but now there's a wreck on the route that you would take that got traffic backed out. Yes, you have lights and sirens, but that doesn't move gridlock. So call the helicopter situation. Consider the weather. You might want to call the helicopter. You might be far enough away to need to call the helicopter, but the weather says no flying. So then you're going to ground them anyway. No, oh, okay. I said 40, 40 minutes, but 20 miles. Now, anytime you have an extended extrication, whether you're from a car wreck or from a collapse or some, or the person's well out in the woods or something like that, it's always a good idea to call the helicopter. Even if you could drive them in a reasonable amount of time, that extended ed extrication will give the helicopter time to get on scene. They'll be ready to receive the patient as soon as the extrication is complete, and then they can expedite transport and get and fly faster than you could drive. That is a thing to consider. There's always the reasonability like, okay, we're saving five minutes and it's going to cost them this much more. Well, that might not be worth it, but we're saving 20 minutes and or 10 minutes and that's the difference between them bleeding out. You got to look at what's their condition, you know, how do they meet that criteria? Um, yeah, you could, if you're a BLS only ambulance, you could call a helicopter in order to get ALS uh, providers. But as an ALS provider, you should not consider calling the helicopter simply because they have quote, more experience or better knowledge. That's not really a good excuse for a helicopter. You should have adequate knowledge to draw on having completed the certification process of becoming a paramedic. Now, calling the helicopter because they have blood products and your patient needs that, or they have RSI and, um, protocols and your patient needs that, those kind of things, that's a different situation. They have care they can provide that you can't, and that's a reason to call the helicopter. So, um, yeah, I've already kind of covered all these. This uh, bottom one here, multiple patients overwhelming the local trauma center. Maybe you could drive to the closest trauma center in a reasonable amount of time, but you've got so many patients going there already, the helicopters are needed to take them to another trauma center in order to divvy it up in that mass casualty situation. All right. And I've already kind of pointed this out. 
here in Georgia and Mississippi here in the Southeast, terrain is rarely much of a consideration for helicopters because we don't have mountains that are um, high enough to cause a problem for helicopters. Um, out West and even in some parts of the Appalachians, well, actually no, rarely in the Appalachians is that an issue either, but their, their mountain ranges are not normally high enough to be an issue. But out West, you can have some mountain ranges and peaks that the helicopters have to fly around because they can't fly over or they're too tall um, because the pres they don't have pressurized cabins or provide supplemental oxygen for the crew. So those are some considerations, but they rarely are a consideration out here. All right, so as you can see, um, as you probably suspect, most of our trauma care research does come from the military. Um, however, this military research tends to have a really slow uptake on the civilian side. Um, you guys might remember back during in Georgia during the 2014 EMS update, they introduced tourniquets to the field, uh, to EMS. Um, prior to that, tourniquets were used as the last ditch effort. If you knew the arm, was, the extremity was going to be amputated or you knew the patient was about to die, you could use a tourniquet. Well, in 2014, Georgia changed their protocol recommending tourniquets as the first line treatment for any major bleeding, arter uh, specifically arterial, but any significant bleeding, you could do a tourniquet right off the bat. The only time you used direct pressure was when you were preparing for the tourniquet. Um, this came from the U.S. military. It was a study with research done on both military victims, mil soldiers that were injured, as well as civilians that were injured, and was published in 1994 during the U.S. operation in Mogadishu that the story Black Hawk Down was popularized from. 1994, the U.S. military did the study to find out tourniquets save lives and should be used on a routine, regular basis. It wasn't until 2014 that that, that concept was adopted by the state of Georgia as protocol. Prior to 2014, tourniquets were thought to be dangerous and cause more harm, according to Georgia protocols. So while we are moving towards as evidence-based and while the military does do most of our research, it does take a long time for that to carry over into uh, civilian EMS. Hopefully this process is speeding up. People are recognizing uh, with the advent of knowledge, um, the internet and the sharing of material and information quicker. Hopefully this will start to speed up um, in the future but it still can take some time. Pneumatic anti-shock garments. You've probably, if you've been in EMS for more than 10 years, you've probably seen them at some point in time. Uh, less than 10 years, you may have only seen them in a museum. Um, they're great. They're actually a really incredible piece of equipment. What they would do is they look like legs. Um, sometimes they were called mass trousers. Um, they would uh, wrap around the legs in the uh, pelvis area and then you would inflate them like a BP cuff and it would squeeze all of the blood out of their legs, or not all, but a large amount of blood out of their legs and lower extremities and prevent blood flow down there so blood wouldn't be trapped and it would uh, improve perfusion to their vital organs. It would basically vasoconstrict to the core. Obviously, you would have the same issues you would with a tourniquet, but it caused a lot, it, it really helped the patient maintain blood flow, especially with extended transport times. Why were they removed from the trucks? Why did we stop using them? Well, when you cut off blood flow to extremities, we talked last week about how lactic acid and potassium, all that stuff starts building up in the tissue. It has to be relieved in a slow and controlled manner. Pneumatic anti-shock garments are pretty big and they can't be relieved very slowly. They have to be relieved and they have to be. Um, when you take a trauma patient into the hospital, the common action is to go trauma naked. We're going to do a full assessment. And so what you had was a lot of hospital staff <coughs> cutting anti-shock garments off of their patients or instantly removing them, resulting in massive changes in their blood pressure, and the patient would end up bleeding out or having a crush syndrome uh, event 
right there on the trauma table because the anti-shock garments weren't moved, removed properly. So that's a big reason in why they were removed from civilian EMS. Not that they were um, not working, but because of the way they were, had to be used, they were impractical for the continuum of care. And it was causing more harm than good. And that's the way it goes with a lot of things. It's not that the thing didn't work. An example would be procainamide. Procainamide was used instead of amiodarone and lidocaine for a number of years, very effectively for controlling ventricular arrhythmias and PVCs. It worked great. The problem wasn't that it didn't work. The problem is it worked so well it could cause problems and the incidence of toxicity and injury was rather high. And so that's why it was removed from the um, from the trucks. All right, so that's chapter 29. We will have a quiz on chapter 29 next Thursday. We have class, no wait, today's Wednesday, so it's Friday. There will be a class next Friday on chapter 29, and then soft tissue trauma and bleeding um, will follow immediately after that. I always put those ch chapters together because there's a lot of, it's chapter 30 and 31, there's a lot of overlap between those two chapters, both in anatomy and uh, treatments. And then Hopefully, we'll at least start burns, if not complete burns, next Friday as well. Uh, so that's the general plan for next Friday. Uh, that's where we're at.